Thank you, Matt. As, as, my name is Karen. Um, I've been a developer for most of my career, but about uh, four years ago, I joined this admin team, and we run about 70% solar service, 30% rainwater service. Um, over my career, I've been involved in many version control tools, so I've used a lot, and I've also helped to manage them. So when I joined SciTech, I was tasked with introducing not only configuration management, which do that to the puppet, um, but also version control into the environment. I really didn't see a lot of version control at the time. So I thought I'd come on tonight and um, share with you a few lessons that I'd learned over that time and see what your thoughts are about how to actually get into a successful environment that, that hasn't had it in the past. So what I'm going to briefly cover are the benefits of a version control system. Um, what is it going to give you if you're not already using it? Where do you start? Which tool would you use? That's quite a key, quite a huge debate. Um, looking at the workflow, it really is all about the process. We're talking about how you establish your workflow and who an example of what we do in our team. And finally, last but not least, overcoming culture shock. Um, in the end, people don't exactly like the team a lot of the time. So just a couple of things I've learned the hard way um, that might help you if you're just embarking on this journey. So what are the benefits of version control? Well, on a basic level, um, a version control tool tells you what's changed and when it's changed. It's pretty basic. You can do files, you can see the progression over time of what's happened. I like to think of a version control tool as a, being able to tell a story. And depending on um, how good that story is, really depends on the workflow you have in place and what little bits of extra information you put into that process. Um, it also tells you who's made the change. Now that's particularly good for a sysadmin point of view. I mean, I was trying to be in a situation where you're looking at a root home config file, see when it's changed. You might even know what's changed in it, but you have absolutely no idea who did it. So you find yourself looking at the output of last to see who logs on around that time, or maybe you just kill a file to see who's SQ. And that's if you're lucky and they haven't had a terminal session open for months on end. So the who is a really good benefit. Hands up if anyone's found themselves doing that. <laughs> um, and one of the most important things I think it's good for is it tells you why the changes happen. But that's going back to what I said about you need to make sure you get the right information in place. Um, excuse my voice is going. Um, I'll just take you an example. Once we put Puppet in and it was sitting at my desk, and I overheard a colleague exclaiming politely about a um, config file that was changed and all about our process. Um, I knew it was controlled with Puppet, and so we sat down together and we could out the history of that config file and see at the time who made the change. So that was good, we found out who did it. But that person actually had left the company, so we couldn't go and ask them why, what it was put in. But luckily, um, part of our process is we briefly our comments when we make the commit. So my colleague could grab the ticket and they go into service now to that ticketing system. And he could read the full reasons behind why that change was made. So that actually saves a lot of things. It saves on time, because that whole process took five minutes, whereas before it could have taken a couple of hours to figure out. It saves a lot of frustration. In other words, it's still out of grant. Um, and it saves on potential outages, because if my colleague had to reverse the change without knowing the full impact, a um, version control tool enables parallel changes, so you can make changes to a code base in your little area, your colleague can make changes to in their little area. Um, one thing I like about it is that it encourages consistency. Um, from a systemic point of view, systems are great at having lots of little scripts everywhere. So you might have written a little um, a program that does something with a certain name, and by the time it's on its 10th server, you might have taken it let alone the 100 server in the fleet. So bringing all your scripts under version control encourages you to consolidate that script into one version, and then using a tool like Puppet or some other distribution tool, you can then propagate it out to your fleet, and it just ensures that you know every time you run it on each server, it's going to do the same thing. And it allows you to recover from mistakes. This is the main thing I love about it. <laughs> I clearly remember the day that I decided to start using RC while ago. Um, I was developing a way fresh out of uni and I used to subscribe to the dot back method of version control. And that quickly progressed to the dot back dot date method. Um, being the sort of person I am, I like to have things nice and neat and tidy. I decided to clean up my 
scrolling at my tail and said she was growing pregnant some ponies, trying to put that together. So I'm sure a lot of you actually did that twice, so it actually took me two times. <laughs> Thank you. 
nice. Um, so a great flexibility, but it also allows you to get yourself into a lot of trouble. And um, Mercurial is more like Denzel Washington. It's not as interesting, but it's solid and just that little bit smoother. <laughs>
that, we then have production directory, and that's our, our, our source of truth. It's our current um, repository. So once you've controlled that, you can then create um, an integration clone of that. And so basically, people don't log on to this repository so much. They don't get in there. They don't get the first the directory. So that's kind of like the pristine copies. So then, um, say, there's a particular project. It might be public. It might be something else. And he gets a change, one, two, zero, coming into his queue. So he goes onto his dev server, and he clones from the integration branch. Um, he does all these changes in there. Um, just keep in mind that Git and Mercurial have very different philosophies and different terminology. So if you're a Git user, just ignore what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so standards and consistency is really important, I think, to, to keeping everything manageable. All our clones are prefixed with their user ID and then the change number. And make sure that's what I was saying before, the work broken down so that you, the clones are very short. In there, you make the change, you push back to integration, and then the point is completed. So, Fred, also on the team, has two changes come in. He's got um, change 125 and 128, but he cloned he through integration as well at the same time. And so, basically, they've got three complete copies of the integration graph. So, then it finishes his change, he's all happy. He um, does his commit. You can have um, pre-commit books in here for your repository. So this is where you might do your syntax checking or make sure they're putting that change number in their comment before they feel out to commit. And he pushes it back to the integration branch. Um, it's at that point, you, you might have some public code, it's at that point that that's where you can do your automated testing. So we, we make sure people, the owners of people to do their testing and their development clients. And if you want some automated testing to happen, this is where this so it, it might be meant it's probably going to be manual to start with. So you go on to the public, for example, making sure that it runs on you know, Solaris 10, Solaris 11, Red Hat 6, 5, making sure it passes all those tests before it gets pushed into production. Does that make sense? Um, we've got a book in there that basically emails the team link to the dips of all the changes that come through just in case they really object to something coming through. At that point, they have a Everything at once. You need to take. If you're going to have to develop. 
develop a little tool set, maybe pull that into virtual control first, work on that, get the process happening, and then move on to your next tool. Start with a simple workflow. I know I can't leave this point, but keeping it simple is really important. You want people to take up the technology and you want them to embrace it. You don't want them to go nuts too hard and not even try. Um, again, pick something that's edited regularly. Um, the more comfortable a sysadmin is at using a virtual control tool, the more likely they are going to want to adopt DevOps and even talk about DevOps. I honestly think um, virtual control is one of the basic foundations of the DevOps movement, like the generalizing there. But if sysadmin doesn't want to at least do virtual control, they might want to go, want to go even look at any of the other processes involved. Um, just a little point. Comments in the code that you're controlling, the doco, if someone opens up a file and doesn't see at the top in huge letters, this is under version control, they're going to go and edit it. If they see that comment there, it just gives them that mental reminder, oh yeah, I've got to do this again, we can jump onto the, the, whatever dev server they do to go through the proper process. Um, and finally, you can create tools to help manage your workloads. There are a lot of great tools out there that can you know, big users and material users to do this. But we actually found, we kind of built up our own tool set over time. So a couple of examples are we've got wrapper scripts that create clients for each um, project. So we've got a, a script that creates our public clients, sets up the, the correct names, sets up the permissions, puts the right hooks in place, public stuff to run. Um, likewise, we've got other projects that have similar sort of scenarios. I've got a script there called my clones. If it's with a set naming standards and directory places, the script just goes out and finds all the clients that person uses. Um, if they run in verbose mode, then it shows them which clients have what changes, which clients have change sets pending, and which clients are empty and should be deleted. Now, I know there are other tools out there like Tree um, that could be used similarly. Okay, the big one is sell the benefits over time. <laughs> and the point is over time. It is going to be time. Let's quickly push those. Um, a couple of things you could do when we started implementing this, we're really lucky we had a training lab. So we split the team in half. And in our um, repository server, we've got a training repository that people can get in at any time and play with. And they can break things and they can just you know, have a look around sitting people out for two hours while they learn the process. It doesn't take long, but just getting them together to ask questions and, and muck around is it's really, really helpful. And then they go for production when they go back to the desk. Um, the usual things, create cheat sheets. Make sure your wiki documentation is up to date. And it's going to be really hard for some assessments. <laughs> but documentation is really important. Um, I'm one of those annoying people that occasionally like to send hint emails, and it was only at the beginning of the project, so I would, over the course of the week, look to see what problems people are having, making sure we have the documentation up on the wiki, <coughs> so I email it out. Um, people can delete it, that's fine, everyone has their email queue being um, bogged up, but I had more than one person, a few people, so they really liked it because it planted that seed. They only skimmed it at the time, but it planted that seed in their head, so when they had the issue again, they knew where to look. Who to ask? Um, I really like this idea of Matt and Alex as a few talks ago, probably more than a few talks ago, it's having a dedicated chat room for each uh, topic. I think um, having like a version control chat room where people can post questions and not have to worry about interrupting someone or clogging up the email queue, I think it kind of could um, be, it'd be great to sort of promote that um, sharing of knowledge. And over time, it might just be one person that initially has all the answers. Uh, but over time, people will you know, overuse that. They'll discover more and be able to contribute more. I still haven't done that. I really need to do. <laughs> okay. So in conclusion, um, there's a few points I'd like to make clear and probably already have. A version control system doesn't have to be complicated. It really doesn't. Um, start with simple. Have a look at your workflow. That's what matters most. Um, to overcome culture shock, Proper support and persistence is the key. You have to be consistent, you have to um, go through all your tools, you have to just make it concerted when you have time to bring another log into version control. And 
finally a challenge. I gave myself a personal challenge by delivering this talk to try and get over my hurried fear of um, presenting. <laughs> so in return, I'd like to pose a challenge to you guys. Those six admins in the room who currently don't use any version control whatsoever, I want you to go back to work tomorrow, not now, and I want you to pick a tool. It doesn't matter whether you use Wesley or Denzel, either works. Um, I want you to decline, you can change it later, but I want you to immediately control your mind improvement. Just that, that's all I want you to do. I want you to make sure first you've added all your files into the repository, and then I want you to delete all your .bat files. Because I know there's a few out there. <laughs> um, start there. Make sure you do commits regularly, frequently, and anytime you make a change, do a commit, and start from that process. Very soon, I guarantee you, you'll be able to branch out and control things. So there's a challenge, and thank you very much for your time. Put it into 
Torch window so they can then look at what they've been deploying, commit what they need to commit, leave alone what, they, what doesn't make sense. And essentially a deploy release which they run on a production server. And what's actually happening there is each time we're doing a switch to the next tag. So SDN will work out the differences and bring everything down that needs to be done. One of the advantages is, as I said, with 8 gigabytes and only fairly small releases, generally fairly small releases, um, those differences are quite small to bring down from the repository, which most of the time, although we bring down to be large ones. Also means if we bring new servers online, which we've been doing over top from time to time, essentially bringing them up to date, with 8 gigabytes of stuff is essentially run the deploy release, give it the latest one. One of the, the other, one of the other, a couple of beauties about this is rollback is essentially deploying the last tag. So if you're on number two and you want to roll back, you just deploy number one and it goes backwards. We have done that, we have used that. Um, an example of how much effect it had, essentially we had very, a very large release that rearranged um, quite a few of our IIS web apps, so it's about 20 IIS web apps that um, run under this. And there was quite a rearrangement of that. It took us about five hours to deploy it on pre-prop. Myself and one of the other gentlemen, we went through and tested it and worked out what we were doing. And essentially the production deployment was over a weekend, no more than if we'd actually pushed out one prop in terms of time to do it and ease of doing it. Um, in the previous world, I would hate to have thought what that would be deploying that release on 24 servers and five hours a server. As I said with the process, fairly simple, we stop the services. Now, what, second thing that's very important, you want to make sure you don't jam files because you were talking about just running a process and guys don't really understand a lot about version control tools themselves. So you don't actually want it suddenly saying, I'm trying to merge something. So what we actually do is we revert the working copy before we switch it. That means there's no files that are out of sync or whatever is in the repository. So there should be no jams. We actually also do it, I think we also actually do a clean up as well, just make sure there's no, nothing locked. So it makes it was pretty much a guaranteed chance of actually doing the switch. Switch basically is change where you're pointing, what your working copy is pointed to in the repository, and bringing down the updates from that. Uh, we also have a way of discovering if we're putting new IOS apps, apps in. So basically saying, oh, that working copy's not there. So instead of switching to it, we actually check it out. And then we go looking in it for scripts to run, which is how we deploy UIS apps. So we'll look in there for a script to install, doing the installation work that actually has to be done per server. We can't actually be done as a file across the whole thing. Then we start services. So that's how the deployment tool works. Why did it work? Why was it successful? I think there are a couple of things. The first one is we put the revert in there, it's got files jamming. And in fact, what it means is if you do something to a production server directly, the next time someone deploys it, and basically deployments are going out at least twice a week, you will lose it. It only takes one time to lose the changes that you made on the weekend and feel the ire of the customer to not do that ever again. So I think that's actually been one of the most successful bits of it. We actually have a short circuit process. So we have a full deployment which takes, you know, it does take about 10 minutes, 15 minutes to run through all the shutting down services, restarting, doing it all reliably. But we um, can actually push you know, audio files to, to be updated on the fly. But again, what you do is you put them on the staging box, you commit them on the staging box, you may not go through the full deployment, but you then push them, we've got a push tool to push them out for emergency changes and so on. So that will be out of sync. But the revert will clean that up. And the next time, because you've put it on staging, Push it from staging, commit it on staging. The next time we want to roll out a proper full release, we'll just pick all of that up anyway. Um, and basically, some of those things that you get from source control, some of the stuff that Karen talked about. And I'd actually say you talked about you can remove your backups, and that's really what it is. You've got confidence when you commit something, as soon as you've committed it, it's sticky, it lives somewhere, it's not lost. You've got confidence that you can do something. You're not sort of sitting there going, have I got a backup? What's the status of that? One of the things that it's given us is confidence that you know that the, you go to one of these boxes, you have a look at what the, what version of working copy it is, what tag it's on, and you've got complete confidence that that box is that version 
or that release. There's no ambiguity about it. And it's that level of confidence about doing things. And if you do something and it goes wrong, you can roll back. And you can unpick them and things like that. So those things have made a lot of difference to the confidence around the process. I'm going to offer a couple of opinions for um, the round tables. I think the other thing that matters about using repositories in work, and it comes back to how um, software builds work, I think, and that is you do something, you put it in the repository, some process takes it out of the repository and puts it into the final state. So in software, you're committing code and then you're running a build server that actually compiles the code and puts the output in a known spot, which you can then pick up and do things with. What we were doing was we put inputting stuff into the repository and commit, and we've got a process to pull it, pull it out. Even if your process is an X copy, right? even if your process of copying something from here to here is an X copy, the fact that instead of X copying it across, you're putting it in a repository and running something that will pull it out of the repository means that to get something done, you have to go through the repository. Then the repository is right. I've been in a state in, in a previous company with developers who did this. They compile it and they get it working in prod and then they put it in the repository. Maybe. I can tell you the mess that we left when, when we tried to work out why this major release couldn't be rebuilt because some of the things hadn't actually been, some of the things that we put in the repository weren't right. And so, because as soon as you're in this process, I've done the thing, I've got in the final state, oh, that's optional. <coughs> if it's not done straight away, it doesn't matter. That's what that says. And so I'm going to put up the opinion there that you want to build your process so that the only way to get to your final state is through the repository. So the second lot, the questions that were put up there, why use version control? Confidence. Whatever you've done is sticky. Go away and do it. I think, yeah, go away and take Karen's, con Karen's challenge. Throw away those backup files. In fact, one of the problems we had was people would go, I'm not confident about this. And so not only was our server full of you know, 8 gigabytes worth of prompts and the audio files, there were so many backups of those. And you go in and find backups of backups and, and three or four copies of backups with this version and that version. And in, recent, and in actual fact, recently, we actually tried to find one of those because it's been a major upgrade and the original version of it disappeared. And who knows? What should we version control? Um, again, probably easy stuff. Uh, stuff that you don't want to lose. So same, same thing. How do we get started? I said at the start that people were talking about a particular problem. They were talking about the deployment problems. That was the talk, not just among the technical people, among management and things like that. That's the problem to go for. Because that's the one that's got mind share. That's the one that's going to, if you get it off the front page, people will notice. People will see something, people will believe it. How do we get stuck? Another thing that I've found is, having done this in one of our customers, in our large, large customer, we had another project and one of the developers came and said, let's use this for X, Y, Z. And one of the other support engineers took up the challenge of doing that. I put in some tables and scripts, we re reworked it a bit. And I think he was a little bit dubious, but he took it off. And he came back and said, why did we ever do it the way we were? Why did we ever do this manually? Why didn't we do this before? Because now we just deploy it, it's easy. That's what you're after if you want cultural change. That's what you want. Is you want someone to come back and say, why didn't we do this before? Why haven't we always done this? Should we really conversion control everything? I wouldn't be worried about that. I'd be worried about getting started myself. Anyway, those are the thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you.